Our scripture reading this morning is in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. I'm going to read from the King James Version. And it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Well, the uh, message today is about uh, anxiety and worry, and if we'd have broadcasted that, we'd probably have half the crowd here today, because he said, I ha I've experienced it all week. I don't expect to get it on Sabbath. Uh, so we'll try to make it as light as we possibly can, and so forth. It would be nice to have, and uh, I might say that, usually when someone speaks about a certain subject, it's because they're the ones that are dealing with it. Did you ever know that? That's why they used to change pastors every five years. We knew all of his problems after about three and a half months and so forth. Uh, so anyway, uh, we might, uh, when you catch Pastor Jay, you might remind him of that uh, and so forth. But no worry, no anxiety, I will tell you right now, I wish that was the case. Of all the living things that God has created, it seems like human beings are the only ones that worry. We worry about taxes. We worry about finances. We worry about our jobs. Parents worry about their children. Children worry about their parents. You name it, somebody is worrying. And if we could categorize worry into maybe four different areas, we would think about, first of all, change creates problems for us. Relationships create problems for us. Health issues. And lastly, money. Pretty much all worry and anxiety falls in those categories. Now, several years ago, there was a comedian by the name of Bob Newhart. How many know Bob? Not as young as I thought. Bob Newhart did a sketch about a particular occupation many years ago, which epitomized, in essence, what stress and anxiety is all about. And he talked about the hundreds of men and women who, in essence, would leave their house every morning not knowing exactly what they would look like at the end of the day. And he was talking about the driver training instructor. Let's visualize for just a moment a home sitting in suburban Chicago. And there is a late model car in a driveway. And a middle-aged woman is climbing in on the driver's side, and her name is Mae Robinson. On the other side of the car, a young man steps into the passenger side, and his name is Chris Taylor. And this is the second training session, driver training session for Mrs. Robinson. So let's pick up on the dialogue as we're talking there in the car. Well, good morning, Mrs. Robinson. I'm Chris Taylor. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm your new driver training instructor. And you know what? We're going to have a good time today. We're not going to be anxious. We're not going to be afraid. In fact, you're going to learn many things today. Things will give you confidence. Things will make you a safer driver and help you to drive in metropolitan Chicago. Now, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you, if I may. Is that okay? Okay, good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is your second training session. Is that right? Oh, okay, that's good. And uh, your previous trainer was uh, Mr. Johnson. Is that true? Okay, good. Uh, now, uh, how fast were you going when Mr. Johnson jumped out of the car? Uh, Seventy-five miles an hour. Uh, could you tell me exactly where that was at in your driveway? Uh, yeah, I, I know you feel bad about that. You know, I checked on him, and, you know, I think he's going to be just fine. It's another three weeks of traction, and I think he'll be just, just great. Now, uh, I don't want you to worry about that. Now, how far did you get into the lesson and the training session with him? Uh, backing out, I see. Okay, well, that's good. It's good to know. Now, first of all, before we start this morning, I want you to do a few things. First of all, are you familiar with all the gauges on the dash? Okay, that's good. Uh, uh, what about the rear view mirror? You know how to use that. That's good. What about the two side mirrors? How about the accelerator? You know about that? Well, that's pretty obviously you do. Yes. Now, now the brake is very important, Mrs. Robinson. Now, wait a minute. What's that? 
Before Mr. Johnson jumped out of the car, he yelled to use an alternate way of stopping. What, what's an alternate way of stopping? Slamming it into reverse. I, well, that would work. Sure, I understand that. All right, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. And the first thing I want you to do is to start the car. Uh, Mrs. Robinson, you just turned on the windshield wipers. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I agree. Everything looks about the same, doesn't it? Well, I'll tell you what. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and back out. Now, make sure you check your rear your mirror. Mrs. Robinson. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to make you cry. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well, you see there was this bus. Oh, that's okay. Let's just don't worry about it. Let's go ahead and back out, and uh, you don't find very good. What's that? Uh, you, you, you're afraid to drive in traffic. Uh -huh. You're afraid you're going to block a lane. Well, I, I don't think you have anything to worry about. As long as you're sitting here in the safety area in the middle of the highway, you won't be able to worry about that. That's okay. Now, let's, uh, let's start uh, driving here. Let's go ahead and put that in drive. That's that number that says D on there, that letter. Uh-huh. Uh, well, now, since we're in reverse, I guess we can, we can go ahead and do that now. I was going to wait till the end of the lesson, but that's okay. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, let's stop here now, and we're going to work on turns. And what I'd like you to do is I want you to kind of ease in. This is a one-way road, and we're in the far left-hand lane. There are three lanes here, and I want you to take a right. Okay, and you think you can do that? Okay, good. Let's let's do that. That's good. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's great. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that you know that was one of the better turns I've seen in my life. Now you did the right thing. You had the right hand turn lane on. You eased into each lane. I just kind of assumed you were going to turn right, not in front of the three lanes of traffic. Uh, uh, yeah, they'll stop honking any minute now. Uh, uh, and yes, uh, they're not saying nice things, especially that man you knocked off the road and that's sitting on that fire hydrant over there. But that's okay. We're going to be just fine. So uh, let's let's try another turn. Uh, well, I didn't mean really to turn into this alley, but uh, you know uh, we could do some alley training. That would be good. Uh, and so forth. I think we're the only instruction school that does alley training. Now you got to slow down. You're going too fast, Mrs. Robinson. Uh, okay, good. Now, uh, uh, wait a minute. I think we're going to have to hold up here. I don't think we can get between that truck and that building, Mrs. Robinson. Uh, Mrs. Ro Mrs. Robinson! Uh, well, I've been wrong before. I don't know how we got through that, but that's, that's, that's great. Uh, let's get back on the road again, if we can, and uh, let's try another turn. Uh, if you could turn right up here. Oh, Mrs. Robinson. I met at the next street, not in this man's yard. Now, just a second. Let me roll down the windshield. Uh, sir, sir, uh, could you turn off the sprinklers, please? Uh, just seated. I can see it. Well, I, I, yeah, I can understand you'd be a little burned up. But, uh, uh, Mrs. Robinson, we're going to have to back out. Uh, this man's really unhappy uh, and so forth. So, make sure you check your rearview mirror. Oh, Mrs. Robinson, you just hit someone. You, uh, you, you were blinded by the light. The red light. The flashing red light on the car you just hit. Uh, yes, officer, she was just telling me about it uh, and so forth. Yeah, I can't believe it either. I'm her driver training instructor. Uh, what was that? Uh, why do you want my name? Uh, so you can get me the next time. I see. Well, uh, Mrs. Robinson, look, uh, I'm going to have to go downtown. This officer is not very really happy with me, and I might be down there for quite a while. Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, there's another officer here. Would you mind just going home with him? Uh, when is our next lesson? I think we may have to do a rain check. How many would like to be a driver training instructor today? Well, it would be nice if we could humor our way through life. More than anything else, I like to have a proactive attitude. But it's not always easy. Worry and anxiety is a part of life. And I'll tell you why it's not a good thing. It damages our health. It disrupts our productivity. It has an effect on how we treat others. And lastly, it reduces our ability to trust in God. But because of the world that we live in, 
Worry and anxiety is a huge problem. Would you agree? And we're going to give you some solutions today that are somewhat elementary and somewhat simple. But Jesus thought and would agree with us today that worry and anxiety is a problem because on one of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about life. And some of us are saying, you're kidding, right? But that's what he said. Don't worry about you, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and clothing? You know, my freshman year of college, I took Psychology 101. Now, that's been a few years back. I don't even know if they offer that course anymore. But uh, I remember we studied one thing in particular, Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Theory. How many remember that? And how many tiers were there? Do you remember? Five. Hey, that's good. Five. Okay, you want to come up here and finish this? Or? Oh, okay, all right. Well, Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory is basically a five-tier model of human needs in kind of a hierarchical level type thing that when you get past the first one on the bottom and you go to the second one, then you go to the third. And the first one is physiological needs. I'll come back to that in a minute. Then there's safety. Then there's relationship. And actually, at the end, one is called self-actualization. Did you know that Jesus addressed Maslow's theory of, of, of relativity? I say relativity because he didn't, didn't probably have this at all. But he addressed Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And he addressed the physiological needs. Why do you think he would start at the bottom tier? Because the bottom tier basically involves survival. And Jesus said, don't worry about your survival. That's really what he was saying. What is these things? Well, shelter, food, and clothing. Pretty hard to live without those. Jesus said, I don't want you to worry about it on that mass crowd on the Judean hills. Because you know what? They have the same problem we have. We're anxious and we, and we worry. You know, Jesus pointed out something pretty practical. And this is interesting. He said, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? Can any one of you, isn't this a great statement, can any one of you, by willing, add a single hour to his life? Well, it's a good point. We probably reduce the hours we'll be living by that constant eye of stress. Jesus is concerned about your anxiety. He's concerned about mine. Because as we read the scripture reading this morning, Cast all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That's why he wants your anxieties, because he cares. He's concerned. And so this morning I am going to approach the answer to this issue in a relatively simple way in one of the greatest stories in the entire Bible, the miracle at Cana. What a wonderful, wonderful story that is. There are so many sermons that can come out of that. And today you'd say, well, are we going to get stress and worry out of that story? This story is interesting, and it's somewhat puzzling. Why would Jesus use this event to kick off his ministry? Now, let's say that you were asked to be his PR agent. And you're going to prepare the event that will be the kickoff of Jesus' ministry. So you're a PR agent for an, a large firm, and they say, all right, we'll take that job. So we get into this large conference room, and then we say, well, first of all, we all agree it's got to be spectacular. It's got to be something that will get people's notice. So one fellow says, well, you know what? I got an idea. Why don't we have him walking on the water? Another fellow says, wait a minute. How about him feeding 5,000 Happy Meals. Another guy says, I got a better idea. How about him raising somebody from the dead? 
everybody agrees in that meeting it must be spectacular. And that's why the, we, the wedding at Cana is absolutely shocking because it's far from being spectacular. It's probably the most simple miracle that Jesus ever performed. And even though it seems simple, when you think about it, it was very practical. And here's why. Why did Jesus perform this miracle? If we look at the scriptures, they give one primary reason. They were out of wine. And we would say, so? They were out of wine, yet Jesus chose this first miracle to deal with an issue of being out of wine at a ceremony to kick off his ministry. That is amazing to me. But it also tells us something. They ran out of wine. Why is it a big deal? That wedding is really a picture of life. The problem was that they were running on empty. And how many times do you and I, have we had the experience of running on empty? We've got a problem we can't solve. We're in a crisis that we cannot handle. We've dug ourselves in a hole that we just can't get out. We're at the end of our rope. You ever been at the end of your rope? I had a situation in a particular laboratory that I consult with. And they went through what we call a LIS conversion. That means laboratory information system. And if some of you who uh, understand what I'm talking about, if you went through one of those conversions, it is an absolute nightmare. The lab director who was trying to head up part of that program was receiving so many emails and so many things going wrong that she said, I, I'm at the end of my rope. She was so stressed. But you know what? When we're running on empty, there's something that God's trying to tell us. Our problems are God's possibilities. You have to think about that. The miracle that Jesus performed at that wedding was very simple. It gives us one of the most profound lessons that you and I can, will ever learn. It gives us a formula that never fails in addressing worry and anxiety. So what do we learn? Number one, if you take your Bibles with me, you want to turn to John, the second chapter, verses one through three. You know, I'm always amazed that this story of the wedding in Cana was only mentioned in one of the Gospels, right? The book of John. Maybe one of the reasons that John is one of my favorite books. Well, let's read the text. Verse 1. On the wedding day, or on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. The problem? They had no wine. It's that simple. Why was that such a big deal? Back then, wine was to a wedding as a wedding cake is to us today. Can you imagine going to a wedding and there's no cake? Hmm, I can't. You know, I uh, just a little bit of information, which you probably don't need, is that we had a tradition many years ago that um, you always stored your wedding cake. And they always say the flavor of the cake over the years would probably, hopefully, would match or improve over the wedding, the marriage itself. Well, after about the fifth year on our cake, it wasn't getting too good. The wedding, the marriage was better, which is good to hear. But cake was important. In fact, one of the pictures that we have of our wedding, one of the major pictures is Carol cutting the cake with me looking over her shoulder, which is pretty much a common picture all the way through all of our pictures. But uh, so anyway, not having cake is not a life or death issue, but it's a problem. Not having wine in Canaan was not a life or death issue, but it was a problem. 
And you and I might say, well, this is a trivia situation. Who cares about the wine? It's got to be something more dramatic here. I want to tell you something. Jesus is interested in all of our problems. I don't care how trivia you or somebody else might think. Isn't that nice to know? These are real problems. They are day-to-day -day problems. They're problems we face day-to-day. -day. Jesus was more than happy to deal with every one of them. Losing your job, losing your keys. I have a son. That, boy, when he loses his keys, it's a major problem. Isn't that right, Scott? <laughs> How many lose their keys? I see we have a few honest souls in the, in the congregation. That is a major disaster in some homes, right? But it's a problem. It's a real problem. You know, evidently, Mary, who was head of the ceremony or the marriage coordinator, if you will, she did not want embarrassment to, to come to her friends and to the bride and the groom. Is that a good reason to reach out? I think it is. Mary did exactly the first thing any of us should do when there is a problem. She took it to who? She took it to Jesus. Maybe trivia to you, but it wasn't trivia to her, and it certainly wasn't trivia to Jesus. She didn't push the panic button. She didn't pull out her hair. She didn't yell and scream. Her blood pressure was probably still relatively normal. She simply turned to Jesus and let him know, I have a problem. How many of us do that? How many of us do that? I know that that sounds rather simple. And rather elementary, but the gospel is simple and elementary, and how many people do not accept it? You can't get any simpler than the gospel. We just can't buy it. We just can't believe that God would really forgive us, that God would really take our sins and throw them to the depths of the sea. Well, you do when you understand that Jesus is worried about not enough wine. I know that that's simple. And I said before, it's elementary, but let's be honest. What do we usually do? My guess is, too much of the time, when there is a problem, we turn to other people, anyone and anybody, and the last one we turn to is Jesus. It's just our tendency. Morris Venden tells a wonderful, I love Morris Venden. Morris Venden is the reason I'm here today. How many could say that? Morris Benden meant a lot to me. He changed my life through the, how he presented the gospel. And I will tell you something, I'll never forget that. And there are many others who have the same profession that I do. But Morris Benden told a story, and uh, he had an appointment to go to, and he had to get a couple of kids to school. So he climbs in the car, he goes to start it, and guess what? No, he had his keys. The car would not start. So Moore's Benton had the mechanical skills that I have, which is pretty much Zippo and so forth. And I have AAA, he didn't. So he went outside, he opened up the hood, he pulled off the battery cables, put them back on, checked through wires, kept going back and forth the car, turning on the car, wouldn't start. And finally, he was so upset. One of the kids from the back said, hey, Dad, why don't we pray about it? And Moore's Benton said, have we come to that point? Have we come to that point? Why do you think God allows problems to come into our life? God is strong enough. He is powerful enough to take our problems away. He could give us sunshine instead of rain. He could give us roses instead of thorns. But you know what? If that was true, we would never come to him. Have you thought about that? When are people most likely to come to Jesus? When they've got a problem. Isn't that right? What happens we take the problems away? There is a good thing in problems. Jesus wants us to lean on him. Do you ever remember the song? We never sing this, Dan. Learning to what? You ever heard that song? What a song. Great song. Learning to lean is the epitome of how to learn and live the Christian life. Would you agree? Learning to lean. Well, 
So when we're running on empty, we turn to Jesus. The second thing we need to do is talk to Jesus about the problem. You know, a problem well-defined is a problem that's half solved. You ever heard that? I know in the business world, we have to define the problem, really define what is the problem, not the symptom. What's the problem? Once you have that straight, you're on your way to solving it. And when the wine, one, and when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, we have no wine. Well stated. This is exactly what Mary did. She tells exactly what the issue is. It's a big problem. In Bible days, a wedding was one of the greatest social events on the calendar. You got an invitation to a wedding and you didn't go. Uh, that's not a good idea. But what's interesting is how Jesus answered Mary. And that has always bothered me, at least up until a few years ago. To some people, it's amusing. Woman, why are you bothering me with this? Now we say, yeah, I can understand that. Who cares about the wine? And that's what he said. My hour has not yet come. I want to tell you something, husbands. If you're sitting in the uh, living room watching a, my, uh, a football game, and your wife says from the kitchen, hey, honey, would you uh, take out the garbage? And you say, dear, my time has not yet come. Uh, probably your time has come. Uh, if uh, you give that kind of response, I wouldn't recommend it, and so forth. Jesus really didn't mean the way it sounds. That was kind of the oriental approach to how they address people. What Jesus was really saying is that he was not willing to announce he was the Messiah. But he didn't tell her no. He really didn't say yes, either. What he was telling her, he said, you know, Mary, I'm no longer your little boy. I'm obligated to do whatever you ask. I'm now the Messiah, and I must obey my true father. That's what he was saying. Mary didn't have any advantages over the rest of us. Jesus looked at her as he looks at you and me. He loves us all. He was starting his debut as the Messiah. And so, he had to remind her of that in a very key situation. But let's don't miss the bigger, bigger picture. Mary has a problem. She turns to Jesus, tells him the problem, and did he do it in order to impress people? You know why we can answer that he didn't? Because of the fact those people didn't know. The only one, and there's a reason why it didn't spread wide. I'll get to that in a minute. But they didn't know. The only ones that knew were the, were the servants and the disciples and Mary. Did he do it to announce that he was the Son of God? Of course, no. That's the very reason he probably didn't want to do it. But he did it because we find in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast your all your anxieties on him. He did it because he cares not only for Mary. He cared for that bride and groom. He cared for the people at that wedding. He did not want them to be embarrassed. Does that tell you something about Jesus? Does that tell you that he's concerned about everything we do? Is there anything we cannot take to him? The answer is no. And lastly, number three, first we come to Jesus, first we define the problem with him, and then one of the most important things, we trust Jesus to do as he's promised, to deal with the problem. And that, as I said before, the most important thing that we can do. You know, there's one thing that we need to do when our marriage is empty, when the bank account is depleted, and we have nothing left in the heart, is to do what Mary said. And here's what she said. Mary said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. That's all she said. That's the greatest piece of advice that you will find in the entire Bible. It's probably the best advice you'll ever find in history. We don't have a problem now or ever 
that Jesus cannot solve, if we do what he tells us to do, what would have happened if the servants didn't fill the jars with water? Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. You know, I think of the disciples. I bring it up a lot because the major problem the disciples had was that they wanted to see who'd be first and so forth. And Jesus, time after time, tried to explain to them that the gospel and being a leader in the church, or being an apostle, means being head servant, to serve people. They never got it. In fact, many times they would walk about a quarter mile behind Jesus so they would start arguing about who was going to be the greatest. It was like he couldn't hear. But Jesus didn't give up on them. But look how much happier they would have been if they would have taken his vice. This arguing at the Lord's Supper before his crucifixion would have been eliminated. God is patient with us. Aren't you thankful for that? And the apostles turned out just fine. Now let's take a look at how this worked in this ceremony. There were six jars of about 25 or 30 gallons, held 35 or 25 or 20, 30 gallons of water. And Jesus said, I want you to fill them up. Fill them to the brim. And you must remember, Jesus gave the command, fill them to the brim. I think if they filled them half full, it wouldn't have worked. We needed to follow him implicitly. And then it says here, and he said to them, now draw some out, take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, and how it had become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn it did. He said, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. We must remember, we sometimes have it backwards. We think obedience follows blessing, but in reality... Blessing follows obedience. Would you agree? So, when we do obey God, and we do what God tells us to do, we can expect him to come through. Jesus tells his followers to fill those jars with water. Now, I want to share something with you. Those jugs normally held water that was used for ceremonial washing. I'm told today by many Jewish scholars, why in the world would you take water that was used to wash dirty hands and fill it with wine? If the master of ceremonies would have known, he could have placed them in prison for that very act. They risked their lives to take those jars to the master of ceremonies. But they didn't have to worry. Because Jesus made us the sweetest wine that you could ever drink. And you know, the best thing of this story is something we just pass over. And we did this morning. I want you to look carefully at verse 2, John chapter 2. It says this. Jesus was also invited to the wedding. The greatest thing that happened that day was not that a bride and the groom became a married couple. The greatest thing that they did was to invite Jesus to that wedding. We've talked about three ways to handle problems. First, take it to Jesus. Number two, define the problem and discuss it with him. And number three, do what he tells you to do. But more important than that is have a connection with Jesus. Stay connected. And you can, you can approach the throne of grace at any time. With confidence, knowing that he will deal with your issue. Remember, our problems are God's possibilities. Let's pray. Our Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and his love. You know, we, uh, we try to reserve the what we think are the most important things, and we try to handle the others. We're sorry about that. 
we realize uh, as we take time to study your word that you care about everything. And we know that worry and anxiety really wears us down. We trust today that you'll help us to come to you, regardless of the situation, regardless of the problems, that will bring these things to you. We give thanks for your goodness and we give thanks for your grace. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.